Our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 10 to 11. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 10 and 11, there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. It is God's desire that we get acquainted with his voice and with his language. None of God's child should be a foreigner to the language of God. Of course, what has brought us this far and the reason why we're here is because we understand that God speaks. And if we become foreigners to the language of God, then we have no direction, we have no hope. The language is meant to give instructions and to give direction. But when we do not understand the language, the instructions given, the direction provided will be foreign to us. It becomes a foreign language. When Israel is moving, the Hebrews are moving out of uh, Egypt, they come to Jericho and in order for them to take a hold of Jericho, God gave them specific instructions in a language. The instruction, of course we know that when you go to battle, you depend on the weaponry that you have. You depend on the power of your arsenals and your, 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 your shells that you drop and so on. But in this regard, God said, pack your weapons. Because I am not going to need your weapons to fight this battle. Because the battle is the Lord. So God says to them, the weapons I'm going to allow you to use are not the weapons that you have come with. But it's going to be the weapon of your mouth. So God gave them an instruction. Go around the walls of Jericho for six days, say nothing. Just go around, circle it for six days. Don't say nothing to your neighbor. Don't say nothing to your enemy. Although you see them coming, just keep quiet. And then he says, on the seventh day, you shall go around six times. But on the seventh round, you will not throw your spears. You will not throw your javelin. You will not throw your missile. But you will shout. And when they did so, the walls of Jericho came down. They won the battle based on an instruction. Hear me, child of God. Your victory is in the language based on the instructions that are given. So if you become a foreigner to the voice of God, a foreigner to the language of God, you will not win the battle. And so today we are looking at the subtitle, The Language of Victory. Every battle you fight, you must fight knowing that you will win the battle. But in every battle you fight, there is a language. I remember 
when we did some works somewhere in the West, in the Western country, we were involved in the security of the, uh, of the property. The langu- we used certain languages. We used tenfold, we used chords, tenfold. 1021. We knew what all those codes stood for. The, 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 the whole purpose of us adopting that language was to make it foreign to the person who was not part of our team. So that they don't understand what we are up to. So that they don't pick the language and go ahead of us. So in the kingdom of God, ladies and gentlemen, there is a language. And every battle you fight, there is a language. And you win based on the understanding of the language. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The language becomes very important because it provides you with an opportunity to understand. And if you understand the language, you might lose one battle, but the war will be won. You understand that sometimes it is part of the package to be down. But we will win. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. A setback is not an indication that God is not with you. We first of all have to understand what God has committed to us. He has committed his kingdom to us. We are sons and daughters of the kingdom, but also we are sons and daughters involved in the war and in the battle of God. We carry the the ammunition, we carry the weapons of God. We are the only legal agent here on earth who can carry the weapons of God. A witch doctor cannot carry the weapons of God. A thief cannot carry the weapons of God. A sorcerer cannot carry the weapons of God. Apparently, even the angels, when they are coming to our aid here on earth, they need the permission of man. So God has committed to us not only tongues, but the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. And you manifest the kingdom, you speak the kingdom, you leave the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. We are the agents and we are the individuals who carry the authority of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, all authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. And the same authority I give to you. Go and make disciples of all nations. The whole essence of a language is to control. You will never control a group of people whose language you don't understand. You never control a group of people who speak a foreign language to you or to whom you speak a foreign language. Once we understand that the kingdom of God is within us, once we understand that to us has been committed mysteries, has been committed power. We change the way we carry out ourselves. Somebody say, I'm powerful. Come on, say, I'm powerful. But then, the challenge that we have is that the understanding of this lifestyle 
has been watered down by certain teachings which suggests to us that it's going to be easy and that everything will just be under your feet and you'll make it and uh, everything will just go straight. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's where I'm getting into today. Some of us will make it with scars on our faces. Some of us will make it with many visits to prisons. Some of us will make it with a lot of rejection because Christianity is a battle against the systems of this world. Our understanding of Christianity is that we will have good life. Of course, it is in the Bible of good life, but we preach one-sided messages. We forget to remind people that Jesus said that the world has rejected me and it will reject you also. We forget to remind people that Jesus said, you will have tribulations. We forget to remind people that Paul reached his destination on a piece of wood. We promise people a particular picture of Christianity which is just full of gold, full of fruits, full of roses. So Christians don't know how to fight for the kingdom of God. The apostles who gave us the New Testament never saw roses. They never lived in expensive homes for the sake of the gospel. They died like criminals. That's what the gospel is all about. I'll go further and say the gospel and Christianity is not going to state house to have coffee. That's not what it is. And you feel we are men of God, we are women of God. That's not what it is. Because Christianity is a battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. It's about pulling down the systems. And every kingdom has got a language. I'm going somewhere. Every kingdom has got a language. And every... La uh, I'm going ahead of myself. Let me come back a little bit. Let me come back a little bit. I'll get there soon. In the book of Acts chapter 20... Verse 17 to 24. The Bible says from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and tribulations. With many tears and trials. Serving the Lord with many tears and trials. Serving the Lord. From the time I came to you, you know what I've been through. I have been serving the Lord with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Next verse. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me.
chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. But none of these things move me. Chains, tribulations. I have been laboring in trials and tribulations, but none of these things move me. Because Paul understood the language of the kingdom. He understood what was committed to him, that it was going to be opposed. It was going to land him in trouble. While I understand and agree that Christianity brings peace, but Christianity turns things around. Why should wrong things happen in your sight? And you wink at it. You smile at it. Why are you allowing wrong things happening where you are? And you look away. That's not what the apostles did. John the Baptist lost his head because he saw something that was wrong. He understood the language of the kingdom that we, because anything we do not condemn becomes a culture. I'll say that again. Anything we don't condemn becomes a culture. So the reason why John spoke against Herod concerning Herodias was because if he did not do so, it was going to become a culture of the time that it is allowed to do that. So anything you don't condemn, you allow it. Yes, down the road you come and complain why such things are happening, yet you planted a seed to make it go that, that direction. Paul says, these things do not move me. He said, I am not afraid of trials and tribulations. Listen, Christianity is full of trials and tribulations. That's what it is. In fact, Paul comes to say, count it all joy when you go through various trials because it is for your own good. God prepares us in the oven of trials and tribulations. He does not prepare us in a mansion. It's part of the language. But our language now has changed. It's a language of cars. It's a language of homes and buildings and mansions. It's a language of money in the account. That's not what the gospel was initially meant to be. That's not it. That's not the language that was passed on to us. Fight a good fight of faith. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and only the violent shall take it by force. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel that we have painted is different from what the apostles lived. The gospel of who's wearing the best suit. That's not the language of the kingdom. That's not it. That's not it. The language of the kingdom or of the gospel is the language of the cross. It's a language of the cross. The cross symbolizes pain, symbolizes suffering, symbolizes sacrifice, symbolizes crucifixion. That's what we live for every day. That's what we do every day for the sake of the gospel. I am for the idea that the gospel can land you and it must land you into prosperity. 
But if you only talk about this part without talking about the other part, the gospel, yes, I agree with what's happening with the protocols. Uh, vehicles are being opened for you. That's not all what the gospel is all about. No one opened the door for the apostle Paul. No one did. I'm not against that. What I'm saying is if that becomes the only gospel, then that gospel is of no effect. What are you losing in serving God? I'll ask that question again. What are you losing in serving God? Jesus said to his disciple, whose father had died, let the dead bury their dead, but we are on a mission to establish the kingdom of God. The gospel costs you everything. We understand that the gospel brings everything, but also understand that the gospel costs you everything. Paul says, I die daily. I am crucified daily. Are you dying to self? Are you experiencing some pain because of your faith? That's the gospel. That's the gospel. So Paul says, yes, trials and tribulations await me at Jerusalem. He says, but I am going. I am not deterred by trials and temptations. I am not deterred by tribulations because to me was committed the mysteries of the gospel and I must do it regardless of what is awaiting me there. Can you still go on when you know that there's trouble ahead of you? Can you still go and preach? Can you still confess the name Jesus Christ in the face of persecution? Can you? This gospel of lipstick is not the gospel. This gospel of convenience is not the gospel. This gospel of coffee and cappuccino it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. To us, the gospel must work for us in such a way that we acquire things. Then it's the gospel. That's not the gospel. Paul lost everything that he had for the gospel. While the gospel allows you to gain things, but the gospel can cost you everything. Everything, and if you're not ready to lose what you have for the gospel, you haven't known the gospel yet. That's the language we are phasing away. We are bringing a different language that makes people understand that when they come to the cross, they are coming to be rich. Am I preaching the truth here? That's all we tell people when you come to Christ, you, you become the head and not the tail. You're going to have everything that you need. That's not the gospel. I preach differently today. You're going to lose everything that you have. Jesus lost everything because of the mandate. Paul was a famous Pharisee. He was the teacher of the law. He was a scribe. He lost everything everything if you're not ready to lose everything you haven't known anything I'll say that again if you're not ready to lose everything then you haven't known anything until you stand and say I would rather lose everything and remain on the path of truth you haven't known the truth what truth do you stand for where do you stand? Is your, is your ground really sure and strong? Is the ground which is your truth is strong enough? Or you're also involved in the systems of this world? Romans chapter 12, verse 1, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, pre you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove that uh, uh, what, is, 
What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So the Bible is telling us not to conform. But believers, we have conformed. We have become part of a language, part of a system, part of a scheme that is meant to weaken the gospel. We have become an agent against the gospel, against the power of God. Why don't we see the power of God today? Because we have departed from the language of the kingdom. The language of sacrifice. The language of self-denial. If anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his own cross. Follow. Are you ready to follow Jesus Christ? Are you ready to lose everything for Jesus Christ? Are you, are, are you convinced about your faith? The church has lost its status. The church has lost its power because it has become part of the system of the world. The church has become a wing of a political system. I'll say that again. The church has become a wing of a political system. I'll say that again so that you understand. The church has become a wing of a political system. Why? Because members of the church, including the clergy, are serving their bellies at the expense of the gospel. So we make the gospel become profitable to our own advantage. There are so many people who are holding the microphone not for the purpose of the kingdom. We have sold our birthright. We have become empty. We offer useless and effectiveless prayers at state banquets. Because of the brown envelope that is going to follow. We parade ourselves the government of the day. No, it is the government of the pocket. That's what it is. We have lost our direction. Paul says, none of these things move me. I stand for the truth. I stand for this. Now, if the apostles died for this, then they must have known the power that we don't know. So Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So every system has a language. Every system has got a language. A political system has a language. A drug-pushing system has got a language. Paul is telling us not to conform to the language. Maintain your language because your language distinguishes who you are. So every system has a language. And every language has a purpose. Paul says in the scripture that we read, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that every language is significant. So every language has a purpose. And every purpose has an initiator. Behind every purpose, you find an initiator. Who initiated this? And by serving a system, you are serving the initiator behind the system. And there are only two origins of every system. Either one of them. Either God or Lucifer. 
So you may think, I know it's okay, it's not hurting anybody. But you don't understand who initiated that system that you are serving. And if you serve a system that is initiated by the devil, you are working against God. In church, you are there, but you are working against God. You are even praying, you are even giving, but you are serving another system. And the system is made in such a way that you will not easily detect anything wrong in it. It is schemed to look nice when it is not nice. Ah, it doesn't matter. It's just a small matter. But if you understand the man behind every system, you will not say it doesn't matter. It matters. It matters. The people who are supposed to be agents of the systems of God have become agents against the systems of God. Those are believers. Once we understand the following, then I recommend that our convictions form our language. Our convictions, because Paul says, trials, tribulations, chains. In fact, in chapter 21, I think chapter 21 or chapter 20, let, let me just quickly go to that. In Acts chapter 21, verse 10 to verse 14, the Bible says, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him in the hands of the Gentiles. Watch what follows. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. So Paul says, I am not just ready to be bound. Now, remember the scripture we read at the beginning. Paul says every place we went to, there was a testimony by the Holy Spirit that I will face trials and tribulations at Jerusalem. In chapter 21, a prophet, a very prominent prophet by the name of Agabus comes to Paul and says to him, he gets his belt, he binds his hands, and he says, the one who owns this belt, this will happen to him. He'll be bound. Now, Paul was not disobeying God. Please understand this. Paul did not say Agabus was speaking by a devil. Paul says, I agree with the prophetic word, but he says, I am going to Jerusalem because that is the will of God, and I know what I'm going to find there. I'll be bound. But he says, not only am I ready to be bound, but also to die. Are you ready? Are you ready? So ladies and gentlemen, we understand that our convictions form our language. Paul's language concerning trials and tribulations came from his personal convictions. That is why he is not afraid to talk about trials and tribulations because he knew he was going to face them. And he knew that they were a part of the calling. Somebody say, it's part of the calling. Come on, say, it's part of the calling. Suffering is part of the calling. Trials and tribulations are part of the calling. Denial is part of the calling. 
So the gospel that we understand that everybody will be cheering us on is not from the Bible. It's part of the calling. Even when I stand alone in pain, it's part of the calling. When I stand on the truth, it's part of the calling. In fact, Jesus said they will hate you because they have hated me. It's part of the calling. So Paul's convictions formed his language. So we will know what you believe in by what you say. I'll say that again. We will know what you believe in by what you say. Some of you just laugh. <laughs> uh, we know your language. We know your language. How many of us can defend the truth? And I'm talking about defending the truth at the expense of losing what you have. Paul understood the significance and the power of what he carried. Therefore, he was not moved by what man could do. And his language changed because he understood his calling. Let me say this again. Your language reveals your calling. Your language reveals your calling. Even when we are considering leaders, then you sit back, you are like, and then someone's words begin to ring in your mind, you are like, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. I'm talking about believers, leaders who are with you when things are okay. But when you stand on something that is strong, they will run away. They don't want to, to miss themselves because they have a name to protect. <laughs> no, 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 no. They leave you. Wait. Once you sort it out, they'll come back. Vakariamo. Vakandile. Muchech. They are not ready to protect the truth. When things are okay, they're the ones who carry your Bible. Because they want to be nice. Yeah, I remain being nice. I was not called to be nice. Remain being nice. This gospel, you stand for the truth. You stand for the truth. This gospel is true. Watch this. If the devil can change your language then he can change your destiny. Because there's a language that you can speak. There's a language of victory. So if he can change your language, he's got your destiny. Protect your language. Protect the values of the language of the kingdom. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. First of all, your riches are not what you think they are. Your riches as a child of God are not in buildings, in house, in, in, in cars, in the account that you hold. Your number one riches is the values of the kingdom that God has put in you. That is what makes you rich. Everybody say, I am rich. You may not have any money in the account, just say, I am rich. We're talking about the values that are in you. The values, the power that is in you. Now, if you understand that the power that is in you can even make money for you, you because you, what, the, once you just relate the power in you to money, you are restricting God. If the power in me can make a demon-possessed person scream out, then I, I realize I'm rich. I am rich. So if the devil can change your language, he can change your destiny. 
Because you become your own poison to your destiny. You will kill your own destiny by what you say. I'm coming. Ministry is not a convenience but a battle. And we understand that in this battle, our language wins or loses a battle. Tears are part of ministry or service. The cross is central to Christian service. Number two, our language creates our future. Our language creates our future. Number one, we said our convictions form our language. Number two, our language creates our future. Once you understand what is in you, once you understand what Christ has done for you, then you realize that you do not just open your mouth to talk anyhow. You realize, like the children of Israel, that actually you can win a battle against a fortified system. Against now, understand that there was no way, no amount or no uh, uh, strength of any weapon was going to bring down the walls of Jericho. It was not a war fence. It was, it was wide. People walked over there. It was not a war fence. It was high. There was no way they were going to drill through and penetrate. So if God says, this battle is very hot and strong, and I'm giving you a weapon to use, and he says, it's going to be your mouth. Then you understand that your mouth is not there just for Tawamutwe. You understand that your mouth can create a destiny. Your mouth can create a system. Your mouth can win a battle. You change what you say. And I'm not just talking about creating a, a, a victory just for you as an individual. Don't be selfish. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. You understand that your mouth can cause the entire congregation to lose the battle. You're careful with what you say. Don't jump into battles that you find people fighting that you don't understand. Don't. The Bible says it's like taking the dog by its ears. Seize fighting battles you don't understand. Let them fight. If you don't understand it, you're not part of it. Fight what God has given you. Fight what you understand. So you understand that what you say creates or frames a future for you. Proverbs 23 verse 7, as a man thinks, so is he. Lastly, our victory is our language. Your victory is in your language. Somebody say, I am more than a conqueror. You cannot, be a more, you cannot be more than a conqueror and you're speaking defeat. You cannot be more than a conqueror and you are speaking death over yourself. Somebody say, I will live. Come on, somebody say, I will live. Although you have a chronic disease, say, I will live. Although you don't have enough finances to support you for the next coming month, say, I will, I will live. Because your victory is on your tongue. You use your tongue to speak your destiny. You use your tongue to speak what God has prepared for you. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. In closing. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Or what system can be against us if God is for us? So you say, no, mm, that is a political system. It's very vicious. Paul says, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be 
against us. No, you have to be careful what you say. Who can be against us? We love our lives so much that we are ready to give up on our convictions just to live an extra year of doing nothing. So if God be for us, who then can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trials, shall tribulations, distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love that which is in Christ Jesus. I am persuaded, meaning I believe beyond any reasonable doubt. I am persuaded. I will stand for this gospel. I will stand for this truth. If you move away from the truth, then it was not the truth from the beginning. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor depths, nor persecution, nor peril, nothing will move me from the language of God. Jesus is Lord. I'll say this wherever I am, Jesus is Lord. I will say this wherever I step, Jesus is Lord. This is the banner, this is the flag that I carry, Jesus is Lord. This is the song that I sing, not but Jesus is Lord. This is my confession. This is my profession. Jesus is Lord. Because he picked me from the deep merry clay and set my feet on the king's highway. Jesus is Lord. Even in the face of rejection, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Is Lord that is our language Jesus is Lord not only when it is convenient Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord and if he's Lord he's your language he's your language you say it in the face of danger Jesus is Lord have you ever been squeezed at night while you're sleeping by devils and the more you shout Jesus, the more they squeeze you. And you feel like, maybe let me stop using the name Jesus. They'll feel mercy on me. Jesus is Lord. Even in the face of a sword, Jesus is Lord. Even when it borders on popularity, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If you are here because you think it's convenient, you are in the wrong place. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord not because he's going to give you money. No, he is Lord because he died for you. And he says you will die also. Jesus is Lord. This is the language that is fading away from the kingdom of God. We have become pacifiers. We come when we are preaching, pacifying, we are massaging you. Actually, I was very shocked. All along, I knew that physio was a massage. Until I went there. When they pulled me, then I realized. And some of you, we need to pull your leg. 
We need to pull your finger. It's in pain, but it is for your good. Jesus is Lord. If he's not Lord, he cannot be Lord. If he's Lord, you will not be ashamed to say Jesus is Lord. Don't live for vain things. Don't live for cheap things. Don't live for a massaging message. Live for the bigger picture. Jesus is Lord. Meaning he has to conquer everything through you. And to conquer it calls for a fight. It's a battle. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Make him Lord over your life. You may be a believer, he is not Lord. Because you are the one who directs him where he goes. What he can do. You have become Lord over the Lord. Make him Lord over your life. Because sometimes he will lead you in difficult circumstances. He is still Lord. He is still God. Let us pray. Unless you build the house in your ways and in your style, the builder builds in vain. Unless you build the church in your way, not in a comfortable way, then the leaders of the church are leading in vain. That's why we sang nothing else matters. If money matters to you more than the kingdom, you haven't come into the kingdom yet. If your comfort is more important, you haven't come into the kingdom. You haven't known him. Paul says, I really want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Unless you're ready to partake in the sufferings of Christ you haven't known him in the sacrifice of Jesus in the wounds of Jesus you have to be partners partner with him partner with the cross 